Doesn't it seem that the Eagles took a shit on Jalen? And the owner and GM? The owner, the GM, and the head coach took a shit on their quarterback. Why? That's not the kind of attitude and environment I want to go into training camp. <laughs> Well, good morning, good people. Mark Holmes here with my buddy Cowboy Joe Boo. And as always, I want to say thank you all for watching, commenting, subscribing, and being part of the Joe Boo Sports Report. Without you guys, as well as you ladies, you know that this literally does not work. Hope everybody's having a great day. It is Thirsty Thursday, and we are knee-deep in the worst time of the year. We've had a taste of football with OTAs and minicamp, and now, of course, we're waiting for training camp to open up. Today is the 20th. The Cowboys, one month and three days from now, will be traveling to Oxnard to get this party started. I don't know about you, but I cannot wait. We are actually planning on being in Oxnard for training camp and possibly having something really, really big with my buddy Dan Salio. We know Philly 500 is not going to show up because he never shows up. And all he does is deflect and swears that Mark Holmes is always backing out of this and Mark Holmes is backing out of that. Um, I'll go anywhere, anytime, Philly 500. So we're here, of course, the silly season here, and we have a bunch of things that are going on, something that could affect all of us if you are a person that gets Sunday ticket. There's a lawsuit that's been going on for nine years. Basically, a sports club back in 2015 uh, decided the price of Sunday ticket. You think Sunday ticket's expensive for you? Try being a bar owner because it's even more if it is a commercial business. He tried suing the NFL, and it's been thrown out before and so on. Uh, you know it's big when you have Roger Goodell as well as Jerry Jones. Jerry Jones had to make time from his Netflix documentary, or maybe hmm, maybe they put it in the documentary because, of course, streaming is the way the NFL is going because they literally are taking us fans upside down and shaking us to make sure that every cent falls out of our pockets. So if you are somebody like me who has now got YouTube that also because you got to pay $70 a month to have YouTube then you got to pay if you don't get the early activation $3.99 a year for it come to find out that the NFL likes that price point they want it to be exclusive and so on let me give you a little bit more taste this is actually more of a breakdown legally of it uh, from Mike Ferrello talking with Rich Eisen on a show yesterday. Right now, of all places, uh, Mike Florio here on, on the Rich Eisen show. What what is the um, what is the story? Do you think right now, as everybody hits vacation in the NFL, Mike, what is that for you? Well, well, <laughs> this, this ongoing Sunday ticket trial Go is ahead. a pretty big deal, and it's becoming a bigger and bigger deal. And it's amazing because it was just kind of out there, and not many people were paying attention to it. And now with the slow time coinciding with people like Roger Goodell and Jerry Jones testifying in open court. Goodell's been the commissioner since 2006, and he had never testified at a trial in open court before. There's been deposition testimony, there's been congressional testimony, but never in a trial in open court. We'll see what happens. Yesterday, the judge went off on the plaintiff's lawyers without the jury in the room about how they've handled the case. So there's some drama building there, and it's falling into this gulf where off-season programs are over, and we're just sitting back, really waiting to see, I think, does Tua Tonga-Vailoa, Jordan Love, and or Dak Prescott get their contracts before training camp opens? One, two, all three, or none of them. I think that's the one big thing from a football standpoint that we're paying attention to. Okay, so let's take that one at a time. This case that you say that, you know, a lot of folks might not be paying attention to, you are writing quite a bit about it. But outside of that, do you want to explain what it is and what the ramifications of what's going on? Could possibly Very be. Very simple right. argument. And I think this is where the plaintiffs have gotten themselves into trouble. They've overcomplicated the case. It's a simple argument. Sunday ticket has always been a premium product. It's always been available at a high price. Very high with price. With one option. The whole shebang. Every game, every team, even though it gets marketed as, if you're a displaced Packers fan in Pittsburgh, this is the way to watch the Packers. You can't just buy the Packers. It's always been a very high price. 
And the case is about the argument that the NFL deliberately sets the price high, requires the price to be high, to protect the free over-the-air broadcasts in every market on Fox and CBS. That's what the case is mm -hmm. about. The argument is that's an antitrust violation. The ramifications, if the NFL loses, would be beyond whatever the individual class members would get financially, and it probably wouldn't be much. But the NFL, I think, would feel compelled to make changes to the way Sunday ticket is offered. It would be cheaper for the whole product, yeah. and possibly other options would be available, one team at a time, one week at a time, one game at a time, if that's what you choose to do. So that's kind of what's hanging or in the balance. Or pay-per-view per game. You know, the NFL feels like it has a pretty good case on the law. On the facts, it, it kind of is what it is. The law, I think, is where the NFL is going to potentially find a way to prevail. Is this a jury trial? What, what it is a jury trial. It is a jury trial. And there where? will be a verdict. Where is it? It's in L.A., not far from you, I think. Okay. Out there somewhere. Do I need to stand outside? Do I need to stand outside with a boombox like John Cusack or something like that, Mike? <laughs> you tell me. Like, what, do I, what am I doing uh, here? What yeah, I I, but, but uh, <laughs> look, look, here's what could happen, and this is what people need to be ready for. Sure. Based upon what happened in court yesterday, there could be a verdict against the NFL that will make people say, holy crap, or mm -hmm. something other than crap. <laughs> Good luck And the that. judge could then turn around and say, I'm entering judgment in favor of the NFL, notwithstanding the verdict, because I believe the law doesn't support this case. The case was already dismissed once. And the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals reinstated it. It's been around for nine years. A bunch of different cases brought together. It's like two and a half million plaintiffs. But they could win, and the judge could take it away. And if the judge doesn't take it away, it'll get appealed. And at some point, it'll probably end up before the U.S. Supreme Court. So it's been around nine years. Hell, it could be around five more by the time it's all said and done. So who's the fan that got really pissed off that started this whole thing? That, so that's what nothing anytime be, right? soon. What, what happened? The Mucky Duck, a pub in San Francisco. Mucky Duck. Because think about whatever they charge fans to watch it at home, the charge they impose on bars and restaurants is even higher. So that's the, the lead plaintiff in this case, the Mucky Duck Pub in San Francisco. 2015 is when it all started. And, you know, look, Rich, I, I know from the moment I first became aware of Sunday Ticket, 1994, mm -hmm. my first reaction was, I got to get this. Of course. My second reaction was, why do I got to pay for the whole thing? There's only yeah. one team that I want to watch whose games aren't regularly televised in my local market. So I, that, that issue's kind of been out there for three decades now. And, and I think it's fair for the law to provide clarity one way or the other whether or not this is something that the NFL can do. Whether the NFL should do it is a different issue. Whether the NFL can do it is something that's never been resolved. Mike Florio here on the Rich Eisen Show. Now let's get to the quarterback signing. Uh, okay, we're, we're, we'll ground. leave it right there. What are you, so. what are you hearing in the general... Well, we all know about the quarterback situation, and, and we'll get to that too. So ESPN, of course, has made the Dallas Cowboys the biggest loser of the offseason. And I'm betting, I'm betting that that is an annual award that the Cowboys end up getting because the Cowboys don't do anything. Other than last year, I guess you could say last year was the biggest one that they actually did something because – they did trade for Stephon Gilmore. They did trade for Brandon Cooks. And both of those moves actually paid, paid dividends. Um, but other than that, the Cowboys never, ever do anything big. So the thing is, is here's the thing. You know, the Eagles, they'll go out and they'll sign a big play Slay. They'll go out and they'll get a Bradbury. And as Stephen Jones says, if you mess up in the draft, you're forced to overpay for good players. So the difference being for the Cowboys is when the Eagles are out there signing those kind of guys, the Cowboys sign guys like Malik Hooker, you know, who was injured, but for three years has been a great player, especially for the money. The Cowboys don't go out and sign a big play Slay or a Bradbury because they draft a guy in the fifth round that ends up being the NFL all-time pick six guy in his second year. They don't go out and have to sign an A.J. Brown because they draft a C.D. Lamb. And this is where you might want to say, well, the Cowboys are all in on the UFL players. And the Cowboys, well, that, that seems to be a talent um, train 
that keeps rolling and stopping in the Cowboys station because you can look at Brandon Albury, UFL guy, Kayvon Turpin, Turpin time, our kick returner, UFL guy, guys that have been on the team in the roster for a couple of years that basically are a ham sandwich with a slice of cheese as far as contracts go. And what if, what if, say, a Goldston, who's finally getting an opportunity now, because now we've gotten rid of Dorrance Armstrong, who people poo-pooed when they said he's right there in production with Randy Gregory. The Cowboys are good at evaluating talent. They are. And the Cowboys are very good at finding players that are really good. Their first-round picks, you know, you, you can't argue with that. Somehow the Cowboys drafting players that you look that are in the top five of their position is deemed a bad thing because they have to pay them. The downfall for the Cowboys is managing the cap. Now, some people, here's kind of my take right now, and maybe I'm wrong because I'm not a capologist, okay? And I didn't work for Marketplace Grill and things. But there is a one way to look at the paying a guy early, okay? And I believe this is true, but here's the thing. I get it. They look and they say, pay Micah Parsons now. Micah Parsons' cap hit right now, today, is $5 million, five point some million. Next year, it's like 21, okay? And so the thought is, you got to hurry up and pay Micah. Well, you might want to hurry up and pay Micah to get him happy at least for right now. Because let me use an example of uh, Devontae Smith, who got $25 million. When he got that contract, he was happy as can be. But he's got two years left on basically his regular deal. That $25 million doesn't really start for another two years. And by that time, when you now see Justin Jefferson getting 35, by the time his money starts hitting, yeah, it's a great deal for the team. But I can guarantee you that if he's playing at an elite level, he's going to look like Zach Martin did and said, you need to pay me more money. Right? Because that's what happens. Now, here's the thing. Cowboys could have paid Dak two years ago. Restructured, got it done. But then they would have added that money for those two years. Right? If we kick it and we start that money next year, well, this year, you got to take the 55, get that off the board. The next year when you start out, you can keep that number down less. And that's what I believe is going on. Everybody is trying to read the tea leaves and say, oh, he's going to hit free agency. Here's the thing. There's, the Cowboys understand drama is king. Drama is king. You're Dak Prescott. There's no such thing as bad publicity. You're right there with America's team. If you can win a Super Bowl here, bro, there is nothing that you can't do. And you, you may not even have to win a Super Bowl here because Tony Romo, one of the highest paid commentators out there because he was quarterback of America's team. You are set. If you go to Tennessee, you're not going to get that. The only thing that entices Dak Prescott someplace else, to me, and maybe I'm wrong, is winning a ring. If I'm going to go someplace that has less publicity, it's about getting that ring. So I'm trying to go to a place like, you know, say the Rams that has a great coach and looks and says, we're going to go all in and bring all the people in to try and win a Super Bowl. You're not going to go to the New York Giants that don't have an offensive line. Contrary to him wearing a New York Yankees shirt, okay? That's not where you want to go. The same thing with Micah Parsons. Why am I going to run to go ahead and hurry up and get a deal for Micah Parsons when it's going to increase my salary cap hit this year? I can look around and say, this year and next year, I'm only paying $25 million for Micah Parsons. Hmm. Hmm. Do I want to turn around right now and say, let's get you a deal that's 35 this year and 35 next year? 
Now, granted, you can hide the money, but that's 70 million, 70 million versus 26. 70 million, if I hurry up to get him a deal now for those two years, or 25 million. Granted, if I wait till next year, yeah, the price tag may go up to 40 million, right? But look at what I saved on these two years. People say the Cowboys lost out when they waited to get Dak Prescott's deal done. Well, I don't think that they actually did because the first year he was 680, second 680, third 680, fourth year, $2 million. And then a franchise tag of 31. So you're talking about under $40 million for your quarterback for the first five years. Now, granted, he signed a deal for $160 million, but you look at that deal and you look at the time he's been in the NFL, a $17 million hit, a $19 million hit, a $26 million, and now a 55. Bro, that's actually pretty good as far as quarterback compensation goes. So the Cowboys rushing to say, let's take $95 million along with a new deal right now and put that together when we can take this hit this year because it's already baked into the equation and we can start over next year and end up saving that money. So there you have it. Now, this is to me kind of funny because we've got, this is, you know, NFL live some of the things that kind of I'm, I, I'm mystified that we hear okay as a Dallas Cowboy YouTuber I know I don't have the credibility of being on television or being an insider and things like that but I hear so many things that are basic that are wrong I've heard you know, Jeremy Fowler talking about $60 million cap hit for Dak Prescott, and it's never been a $60 million. Now, you could say Deshaun Watson is a $63.5 million one, but they don't talk about that one, even though it's fully guaranteed, and that's the hit for the next three years. And there is no walking away from that one or restructuring. But be that as it may, Dax was 59, in which case they restructured $4 million of it, and it's down to 55. Now, all of a sudden, we're hearing them say that, you know, you can't franchise, you know, franchise tagging Dak Prescott would be $80 million. Hello? Hello? You can't franchise tag him. It's in his contract. Yes, he's been franchise tagged twice. If you were able to franchise tag him, yeah, it would be about $80 million. But you can't. So why are you saying? Why do you guys keep bringing up? You know the franchise tag would be cost prohibitive. Don't you know? You can't do that. But let's listen in. Cowboys and those contracts filled. What do we need to know? Let's begin with Dak. Yeah, quarterback Dak Prescott going into the final year of his contract. Now some thought an extension might be in place by now, or at least a restructure. But the Cowboys only converted the small roster bonus of Dak's back in March for additional cap space. This team is staring down the possibility of Dak playing out the final year of his contract. And oh, by the way, he's already being tagged twice. Why does that matter? It means the third tag in March would be prohibitively expensive to the point that it might not even be palatable for Dallas. Meanwhile, wide receiver CeeDee Lamb, who is the best wideout in football for the second half mm -hmm. of last season, is sitting there staring at all these deals getting done and saying Free to agency. himself, what about me? He skipped out on mandatory minicamp, which mm -hmm. of course incurred a fine, but that was not the part that bothered CeeDee Lamb. He wants a deal that maybe mirrors that which Justin Jefferson just signed, four years, $140 million, at least in that vicinity. Micah Parsons, perhaps the best edge rusher in the NFL, also looking for a new deal. Maybe one of the problems here is we did not see an, a record-setting deal signed this offseason at that edge spot. Nick Bosa got that right before training camp last year from the 49ers at $34 million per season. You can certainly imagine that Micah Parsons, if he gets a new deal, is seeking one that's very close, if not above, 
what Nick Bosa signed with San Francisco. I realize mm -hmm. emotions get involved here, right? And they, they should, okay, but in fandom too. Involved. But Bill, would it be a wise decision in general business-wise to invest all the capital that would be needed to be invested to keep these three guys in Dak, CD, and Micah? It would be expensive. <laughs> you would be curious. You can do it. Other teams have done it, but it has not worked out well for them. So for the Cowboys to re-sign all these guys, after you adjust for next year's cap figure when they probably will have all three of these guys signed, you'll get more than 10% of the cap for each of these players, nearly half of the cap mm. for just three guys on your roster. Wow. Cowboys are a very top-heavy team, but only two teams, in, rec in recent history at least, have had more than 10% of their cap assigned to three different players. In 2022, mm -hmm. both the Raiders and the Rams did it. Wow. Star players, Derek Carr, Devontae Adams, Max Crosby, Matthew Stafford, Aaron Donald, Cooper Cup. Uh, okay. no issue with those deals, but those teams both had losing records, so it's tough to make. Now, mind you, mind you, before we go ahead and, and kill that, because this is one of those ones where, you know, we're, we're setting a narrative. Derek Carr was has been overpaid. To think that Derek Carr, who has no playoff wins, so I don't want to hear this stuff about how much Dak sucks. Derek Carr was once the highest paid quarterback in football. And they overpaid to bring in Devontae Adams on the team. And, um, of course, their edge rusher was definitely worth it. So uh, I'm not sure I can use that as an example because the Raiders always overspend on everything. But I'll point out that the Rams team was a team that just came off of winning the Super Bowl. They had just come off winning the Super Bowl. But go on. Maybe surround those stars with enough to go on a big winning stretch. Yeah, look at the combined record there, 11 and 3. And both oh, and mind you, the next year they were yeah, the playoffs. Right. The, the Cowboys could be <laughs> not that, right? <laughs> the playoffs so here's, here's the thing. When, when talking about the Cowboys, I feel like this is the never-ending question. Mm. I have been asking people around the league, what are the Cowboys doing? And the question I've heard for months is, can the Cowboys even afford all three guys to begin with? And the fact that there's been no movement, especially on Dak, when we knew this was coming. That's been a surprising. And what have we seen? We've seen Trevor Lawrence get paid. We've seen um, we've seen uh, Justin Jefferson get paid. So the price tag keeps going up mm -hmm. as we see inaction from the Cowboys. So I don't know when this will get done, how many contracts. I don't see how they can sign all three guys. Well, how one, one more point here. Weren't we always talking about this offseason, $60 million for Dak? 35 for CD. What's changed? What's changed? Okay. 60 million looks about like the right number. That's what we were talking about four months ago. CD, we were talking about 35. Maybe it's 36, 37. So one or $2 million difference is now the price is going through the roof when the price is always there. Who thinks that he was going to settle for $30.5 million? Nobody did. Everybody knows the market resets because there's more money in the NFL. Just say this about Dak Prescott. Everybody, and I was on the set a couple of weeks ago, Laura, I think talking with you, saying, yeah. like, you know, the Cowboys, like, just get this done now. Wrap yeah. it up because every quarterback yeah. contract that comes in is only going to push the value of Dak's contract up. And, you know, candidly, I got some response from people that I think are probably even closer to this situation than I am that said, hey, you got to remember something. Dak's resolute. This is a tough-minded guy who a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. when everybody was saying, Dak, take yep. the money. Jerry mm -hmm. Goff, this is back during his first extension with the Rams. Four years, $134 million. Carson Wentz got four years, $128 million for Philly. Dak said, I'm going to play out the string here. The net result was in the five years after the season everybody wanted Dak to extend, made $191.4 mm -hmm. million. Bucks. So his patience, which, by the way, that takes mental toughness because yeah. it's very easy mm -hmm. to just take a generational money contract when it is presented he to you. He should not. Is a factor here. He Dak should not. He has should all the wait. leverage and he's That's going to play thing. it. That's why, why I'm a little nervous for the Cowboys because if I'm his rep, I'm telling him, just, just hang tight. Yeah. Just, and just he said no problem doing that. It's a great point. Yeah. The other thing, too, you got to think about some of these teams that could need quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. They could be willing to pay a whole lot more and maybe more equipped mm -hmm. to do that because yep. they don't have their money tied up in other things. Brandon Ayuk doesn't have a deal yet with the 49ers. There you go. The have said they want to hold on to him. But All right, so there you have it. So, you know, again, Dak Prescott, he's got it made no matter what he does. And... Um, it's kicking back and waiting. It's not a problem. It's not a problem.
And I believe the Cowboys and him, they've got a wink-wink deal. Okay, they know. Okay, hey, we got you, bro. We got you. All right, good people. As always, you know I appreciate each and every one of you guys. And uh, we'll keep bringing you the news, although there's not much news right now. But, boy, we got 77 days left until kickoff of the NFL season. I'm Mark Holmes, and I'll see you real soon. Peace.